Scott Memorial. This is Pastor Stephanie. We are getting ready to go caroling, so I figured I'd get my wonderful video in a little early. I'm trying to get the angle right so you're not just seeing the beautiful ceiling tiles. I'm in the Pearsall class. Um, well, this is one of our wonderful Sunday small groups. They've been meeting. They just celebrated 70 years of meeting, so they have been um, discipling together for a long time, and we are grateful that they are share their wisdom with us. So um, today we are continuing in our series, What Child Is This? in this time of Advent. And we've been talking about how Advent for us is a time of nesting, a time of preparation. New parents, expectant parents, go through a season of nesting as they are preparing for the child that is about to be born. And so we find ourselves in that same place. We are nesting as we are preparing for the child who is yet to be born. But yes, Christ has come into the world, but we also are expecting Christ to return one day. So making sure that we are prepared. So our scripture for today comes from Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 through 11. Hear now these words. <clears throat> when John heard in prison that the Messiah, what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them, and blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go into the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look, those who wear soft robes are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written. See, I am sending my messengers ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist. Yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So John the Baptist is kind of this star pupil. Um, if we think of uh, a star disciple, it would be someone like John the Baptist. Remember last week we looked at John's miraculous birth. He was filled with the, with the Holy Spirit before he was even born. And he was the one who knew that his role was to repair the way of the Lord. So he was baptizing um, for all the people, telling them to confess, but also saying, one who is more powerful than I is coming after me, and I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. In John's Gospel, he writes about John the Baptist who says, I must decrease so Christ can increase. So he knows that his role is to prepare the way of the Lord. He is the one who is to do that. Yet we find um, that he's maybe rethinking that. So now he's in prison. It's important to remember that in this time, prison was very different than what we're used to prison being. So prison for those days was a holding place before you awaited trial where you were either executed excommunicated or found not guilty. So it wasn't a place you spent a long time. So I'm sure he's very anxious, not sure of what he's going, what's going to happen. And as we know, it doesn't go well for him, uh, but he doesn't know that yet. So he finds himself wondering, is Jesus the Messiah? Before he claimed that fully, but now maybe Jesus hasn't lived into exactly his expectations, what exactly he thought Jesus was going to look like or do. Um, he was expecting the Messiah to do certain things, and now the Messiah is not quite living into that expectation. As we see him asking, "Are you?" The, he sent his own disciples, are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? John wanted a traditional hero. He had this idea of what the Messiah was going to look like. Someone who was going to radically come and change the world. There'd be no more poor people. There'd be no more poverty. There'd be no more... Conflict. Maybe that was his idea. Many Jewish people were waiting for this hero on a white horse to come in and save the day. But Jesus wasn't quite that, right? Jesus says, tells John, John's disciples, I'm sorry, tells John's disciples, go and tell him what you see. The blind are receiving their sight, the lame are walking, the lepers are being cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are being raised, and the poor have good news brought to, him, to them. Jesus was a different type of hero. We as people love heroes. Um, as I shared in worship today, so my husband loves TED Talks. And I enjoy hearing about the TED Talks without having to watch the TED Talks, so he enjoys telling me what he learned. 
So he watched one on millennials. He and I are both in the millennial generation. Uh, and this one particular TED Talk talked about how millennials is the first generation without heroes. So for my mom, my parents' generation, presidents were heroes. Both my parents can remember exactly where they were when um, John, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. For them, JFK was a hero, and his death was so hard for many reasons, but one reason was he was their hero. Generals were considered heroes, political leaders, celebrities. These were heroes that you looked up to. For my generation, our heroes have been dethroned. I remember when President Clinton was impeached. I was in elementary school. Um, so yes, it's a hard time right now for our country going through President Trump's impeachment proceedings. But for me, it's not the first time that this has happened and may not mean that he's removed from office because that's what happened under President Clinton. So I didn't grow up with this idea that presidents were perfect. I mean, I, I remember, again, I remember when President Clinton was impeached. Um, I remember when his dirty laundry was aired out, that we live in a very different time. I grew up watching reruns of great shows from the 70s and 80s, one of them being The Cosby Show. And of course, we now know Bill Cosby is not a hero anymore. He has been dethroned. How hard is it that we don't have these traditional heroes anymore? These people that we look up to have all been dethroned because they don't quite live up to the moral, ethical standards that we have for our heroes. John was looking for a hero, and Jesus isn't quite living up to that. Now, we still have this desire for heroes. The Avengers Endgame, which came out this year, is the highest grossing movie of all time, believe it or not, with $2.796 came in from the Avengers Endgame. So we have this desire for heroes. They just don't exist in quite the same way that we thought, right? Jesus was not the traditional hero. So John must become a follower. John was a leader. He has his own disciples. He was out sharing. He was like, he was a rabbi. So he had his own followers. But now he has to ask himself, is he willing to follow? Is he willing to follow this Messiah who looks so different than his idea of what and who a Messiah should be. I had this wonderful quote um, from Feasting on the Word about true discipleship, but essentially, um, since I don't have it right in front of me, essentially the quote is, a true disciple knows that they must work on being a disciple every single day. Every single day we get up and make a choice. Are we gonna follow God today or are we gonna not? And, and honestly, it's in every moment decision. Are we going to love that neighbor who is so hard to love? Are we going to do that thing, even though it means I'm missing my Netflix show <laughs> or not missing it because you can watch it anytime. But instead of sitting on the couch and vegging, am I going to go do this because God's calling me to do this? This is the question that we are faced with countless times every single day. When is the Holy Spirit saying it's time for you to get off your couch and go do something? And when is the Holy Spirit as well saying it's time to rest? Because that's important too. Hear me, hear me loudly. Rest is important too. But Christ came to model discipleship. Christ showed us how to fully love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and how to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. But Christ was not the traditional hero. Just a reminder, the night in which Jesus was betrayed, Judas, his betrayer, had to go point him out. He had to kiss the cheek of Jesus to point him out because to the authorities, they had no idea which one was Jesus and which one was one of the 12 disciples. That's how unknown Jesus was to the people in power. So I lived in Los Angeles for two years when I was a young adult missionary with the US2 program. Um, now, I don't know a lot of celebrities, so I would, I would be with friends that like, did you know that that was so-and-so? I'm like, I have no idea who that person is. But a few times, I did run into people who were on shows that I love. So I love New Girl, and so I happened to run into um, one of the actors on New Girl um, at a film festival, actually. And then um, one of the actors on Community, I love the show Community about Community College, happened to be my, tra my Trader Joe's. <laughs> it was my Trader Joe's, and he was in the aisle, and it was like this surreal moment, like, I watch you in my living room and here you are buying something at Trader Joe's. I didn't go up and make a fool of myself, um, but it was this like weird moment of, oh my gosh, I know you. So Jesus wasn't well known like our celebrities are well known. Jesus was well known though by the people who were seeking him. The people who came to be healed, 
they would come up and touch him just to touch the hem of his garment to be healed. So Jesus was well known by the common folk, but not at all by the people in power. That's how unknown Jesus was, that he had to be pointed out by his betrayer. So the question that we have is, have we been handing our leaders the wrong thing? Often we hand our leaders capes, expecting them, our leaders heroes, capes because we expect them to be heroes, when maybe we should hand them towels, like our Savior. In John's Gospel, he tells of the night in which Jesus gave himself up and that last supper. In John 13, we hear what Jesus did after that supper. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you will have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash, except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, Not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should also do to one another. Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. Jesus did one of the lowest, the things that were washing the feet was reserved for the servants. Washing feet was something so dirty because we have cars. They walked everywhere. They wore sandals. So these feet were really dirty, not just like sunk because they had washed, worn their shoes without socks. I mean, these were really dirty feet. And he bent down and washed his disciples' feet and said, you should, you should do what I am doing. You also ought to wash one another's feet. Yes, I'm doing this thing that is, that is seen as so humble, and I'm telling you, you are to do it as well. This is what Jesus modeled. This is what Jesus said heroes and leaders, true leaders, should do. They should wash one another's feet. Jesus humbled himself and modeled for us what discipleship looks like and asked us to do the same. Another favorite scripture comes from, from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. If then there's any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus models for us what a true leader, what a true hero should look like. One who is humble, one who is obedient, one who does the will of God the Father. And this is what we are called to do. This is the type of leader we are called to imitate, the type of leader we are to look up to. So though our earthly leaders will continue to let us down, we will continue to find out scandals about the people that we look up to. It's just a reminder that Jesus is the one we should always look up to. We should model him. He is the Messiah. Not another one is to come except Christ will return once again. And we want to be ready. We want to be ready. We want to make sure that we are taking discipleship seriously. So thank you all. Thank you, Rachel and Bobby and Chris for watching. Hope you all have a Merry Christmas. 
We're about to go caroling, so say a little prayer for us as we bring some joy uh, to a local retirement community. All right, be blessed.